Praise God. My, my. I've come with another piece of the revival puzzle. Yeah. I'm going to talk about the great harvest today. What God is doing right now. Not later. I'm tired of living on the edge, aren't you? I don't want to be at the door the rest of my life. On the cutting edge, on the threshold, I want to go on in and see what God is really going to do in this great time. The greatest time in the history of the church is now. You know it's always a blessing for us to be able to be here when pastor calls us and asks us to come. You know, we just cancel stuff and quit and move around and do all kinds of stuff just to come here so we can just open our eyes up one more time and say, Woo, wow, isn't this wonderful? Don't get used to this. Now, don't get accustomed to this too much that you just kind of take it for granted. Don't ever do that. There's too much going on here. God's put you at the forefront of this great revival thrust to be the spearhead in this whole eastern country. Hallelujah. For this magnificent moving of the Spirit. With what's going on here in the Holy Ghost, I think I just need to get into what I feel God's saying to me. No songs today. They don't play my music anyway back there. Point, nothing happens ever. I've even got notes today. Brother, when you see me slide notes out of my Bible, you are in deep trouble. <laughs> That's right. Isn't Jesus something? Yes. I want to ask you something. I want to know, did you get the impact of the exhortation today? The pastor gave us. Did you sense that powerful? That's not a small word. That's a great word of God. I've never, ever put that together in my mind or in my wildest thought about Jesus. The last thing they could visually remember of him was his hands up toward them. Isn't that awesome? Amen. And he does, he's not going to let them down. They don't come back down. They were stretched up and nailed up long enough to stay up for you. What a great thing that his hands are out toward us to bless us. And I believe he's going to bless us through his word today. Do you believe that? I always come here with a sense of awe and I never want to lose that. I believe that this is one of the most phenomenal things happening in Christianity today. Upper room is God's thing going on in the east. I think, though I have to be fond enough and bold enough of the anointing to say, I think I have something here. It's not a great, great thing, but I believe it's a little part of what God wants to say to us. And I'd like you to hear me today and see if we can add something to what we already sense God is doing in this great revival. You're going to help me, please. That's awfully weak. Excuse me just a moment, please. All righty, we got that straightened out. Wasn't a big thing, just a small thing we needed to handle, okay? I'm going to ask you to do something with me. If you'll stand one more time with your Bible, take your Bible up. <clears throat> yeah. The book of Joshua, chapter 24. Joshua, chapter 24. We're going to preach about the harvest. Thank you, Jesus. How many of you are ready to help me preach today a little bit? See, we get in this great flow, this great flow. I don't want to just stop everything, but I have to slow down a little bit. Man, you got me panting like a racehorse. I mean, I get up, I'm worn out from jumping around, you know. I got to catch my breath. That's right. You know, with the few physical problems that are obvious with me, I, I can't do all these spiritual calisthenics like I used to. It's a profound effect on my heart rate. <laughs> Smile. That'd do you good. Some of you haven't tried it all day. <laughs> Try. Here we go. Joshua chapter 24. I'm going to begin with the 13th verse. And I have given you a land for which you did not labor. Whew. Come on, you might as well say amen to that. I can't even get out of the first phrase and we're talking to upper room already. Come on, the word of the Lord says, I have given you a land for which you did not labor. Come on, go ahead and say amen to the word of God. And cities which you built not, and you dwell in them, 
Of the olive or vineyards and olive yards which ye planted not, do ye eat? Now, let's all say now. Now, now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. And serve ye the Lord. And here comes this great verse in all of the old Bible. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that are on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, somebody needs to say it today. But as for me, I'm not going to do it by myself. I refuse to go to heaven alone. But as for me and my house, not I will, but we will. Let's say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Shout to the Lord just a moment before you sit down. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise God. You may be seated. Joshua. What a character of the old Bible. Everybody all right? You all settled down? Joshua. Mead, who wrote 250 autobiographies of the characters of the Bible, writes a profound thing concerning Joshua. He said, Joshua, behold an officer and a gentleman, one of the precious few of us whose memory bears no stain. Egypt gave him birth, and fighting in Canaan made him a patrician of soldiery. Moses, dying, named him his successor. It was a good choice. Joshua was one of the twelve spies to go first into Canaan, one of two to tell the truth of what he saw. At Rephidim, he won his spurs, giving blow for blow with Amalek while Moses prayed on a hill. Did you hear Pastor talk about that today? Amen. He earned his epaulets at Jericho while he drove a wedge of spears deep into its enemy land. Gibeon and Ai but clinched his fame. He never was more than a dutiful soldier and under officer of Jehovah. When the wars were done, we hear little more of him except that he divided the land and he preached two good sermons one of which I have read my text from today. He gained a country, united a people to hold it. He was fearless in battle, sharp as a fox in strategy, a wise counselor, a wholehearted servant of his people and of his God. A baby born in a manger was given his name. You see, Jesus is Greek, for Joshua. Isn't that interesting? When you read my text, the first thing you think of is the obvious text. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Isn't that the one you think of? I mean, when you think of Joshua, the famous words, if he said many of all of them, that probably is the most famous. But I'd like you to remember that in that same clause and in that same passage, he said something else. He didn't just say, if it doesn't seem good to you to serve the Lord, then make up your mind. Choose you this day whom you will serve. I mean, choose it today before it gets afternoon in upper room. Choose not tomorrow, not next week. Let's all say today. We need to make choices today about serving God. You see, I don't know how it is with you. I know some folks make up their mind one time and then drift the rest of their lives. But I've had to come back over and over again through trial and tribulation, through unusual circumstance, I've had to go back and reaffirm my determination that nothing is going to keep me from the love of God and that He's able to keep me in this trial because He raises the level of hardness, the level of difficulty in our walk with God is raised as we go from victory to victory 
And from faith to faith, it's not the same little trial I went through last week. I'm going through something with a little more difficulty this time until sometime he moves me completely out of the realm of my human ability to conceive what he's doing to me. Then he tests me totally and awesomely to see if I'll stand in total misunderstanding. Anybody in here? If I'm preaching to you already, shout yes. <laughs> well, we can close and go home then, can't we? No, I've got another piece to the, you know, revival. This great work of God is line upon line, precept upon precept. You don't put a puzzle together by going, <laughs> blowing on and all the pieces jump together. It's a piece here, and then you scratch your head and look around and look around and say, oh, look at that. I, I know where that goes. That looks something like this. Oh, she. Nope, that's not it. Just Here we go. Ah, look at that. Oh, look, that's a tree. <laughs> you ever put a puzzle together? Walking with God is not knowing the whole thing all at one time. If he gave us his omniscience and we knew the length of our life, the term of our days, the time of our passing, the manner of our going, what would happen to our children, what happens to our... We couldn't live in that. Our mortal minds could not stand the stress of the omniscient eternal. And so he graciously, kindly, mercifully lets us walk with him one step at a time. And he gives me grace, not for the whole journey, but grace as my day is. If I need more today, he's got more for me today. If things are easier today, then he doesn't have to pour out quite so much on me. But I know that he knows where I am. Job said it. And when he has tried me, I, sh I may not know where he is, but he knows where I am. And when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Somebody say amen. amen. So Joshua refers back to something more than just serving the Lord. He talks about a pivotal time. He nails down an event, a thing. He says it in a word, and that word gushes into my mind in a thousand different ways. He used the term, the flood. And he sets that up as a standard, and every event of life and time falls on one side or the other of that statement. If it seems good to you to serve the gods that your father served on the other side of the... See how he uses that? Let's all say flood. Flood. So he sets up flood as the most outstanding marker of time he can think of. And he said, or if it is better for you to serve the gods of the Canaanites on this side. In other words, everything is either on that side or on this side of a cataclysmic, unforgettable event by which he marked all circumstances. He called it the flood. I'm not so much concerned about the gods on one side or the other. It doesn't bother me so much about everything that happened on one side or the other. It just astonishes me that Joshua, he is not the most profound man in the world, but in the two sermons he preached, both of them included the statement, the flood. This one particularly, he notes it. It's in his mental psyche. It's ground into his character thought pattern. He can't get it out of him. He can't preach without talking about it. It's the most awesome thing in his memory. It's the flood. What do you think of when you think of a flood? What is a flood? A flood is not a stream. A flood is not a river. A flood is out of control. Come on, is that right? A flood is out of control. When I think of the term flood, the first thing I think of is the flood that came on the earth that destroyed all but eight souls. Noah, God graciously gave him, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord, gave him the opportunity of building a salvation boat in which he put eight souls, including himself. And the Bible says eight souls were saved by water. 
right? And everybody else died. Some folks wonder, how could they be saved by water? I thought they were saved from water. Huh? Now, did the boat save them from water or by water? Well, saved them by water. They're not saved just from water. They were saved from the judgment of God against a wicked generation. The water separated them from the evil generation. The evil generation is on the bottom. The water is in between. The boat is on top. The water becomes the buffer. Isn't that the way God does so many things? You can't get out of Egypt into your journey without going through a Red Sea. You can't get out of the wilderness into Canaan land without going through water. And a lot of our experience, thank God for the washing of water by the word in our lives day after day. I thank God for our experience in water baptism. The Bible says we bury an old man. We put away the filth of the flesh and an answer of a clear conscience toward God. The Bible said, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Thank God for waters that separate. When I think about that flood, it wasn't a little thing. Every soul died. Babies died. Men died. Women died. All but eight people died in that flood. The other day, I saw the news. Gilbert, I think some of our saints here at Upper Room were in some of that terrible storm in the Yucatan, 200 mile an hour winds raging through the Caribbean. When it came into the lower coast of the continental United States and down particularly into Mexico and swept in, I saw some of the pictures of the devastation. What was once a general trickle among the little villages in Mexico became such a torrent out of control that it took big buses trying to evacuate people, big silver eagle bustles that would carry 45 or 50 people and threw them around like toothpicks. They found them 16 miles downstream. That's what I think of when I think of a flood. It's not an easy little thing. It's not a common happening. It's out of order. It's out of the usual. It's overly much. It's too big. You can't handle it. Amen. Something happened in Joshua's life that he marked all time by. He said, I'm going to tell you that things happen either on one side or the other side of the flood. The problem is on this side of circumstantial happening, we can always look back and see the delivering power of God. But it's on the other side of the flood we have a problem. Because back there we're still facing the flood. And we don't know yet just what's going to happen. Amen? We haven't got it all figured out yet. When I think about God's promise to Abraham, and that's where this all started, God told Abraham, get up and get out of this Ur. When he left Mesopotamia, he left his father's house and all the riches and all the things that were afforded him there. And they headed toward that land. They didn't know where it was. They were in search of a city, the scripture said, that had foundations whose builder and maker is God. And they're out here on this journey looking for this place, this land. I don't think he realized any more than we do. You know, God has a neat little way of getting us involved. You know, when you read about God in the Old Testament, he says, he's the first and the... Yeah, and that's kind of the way he works. He's the first and the last. He's the alpha and... He's the... And the... But what he doesn't tell you much about is the fine print in between. He says, hey... Get up and get out, and I will show you a land. Now, that sounds like that's all one deal, doesn't it? He didn't tell him it was going to be 470 years between that. See, we don't have any trouble with the God that starts and the God that finishes. I mean, he called me out of darkness into marvelous light. He's going to give me a home in heaven. But they didn't tell you about these 30 years you've been walking with him saying, what's going on? He's the God of the first and the last, the beginning and the end. But we've got to learn he's the God of the whole in between too. But we've just got to learn to walk day by day, step by step. 
He just gets you out there and gets you involved. And there you are swimming around saying, what's going on? Where are we headed? What's happening to us? You've got to learn to trust him. Come on, somebody say, I'm going to trust him. Abraham, get up and get out. And Abraham got up and got out. He went and spent a few years up in Haran, lost his father, lost his brother. They went on with his nephew Lot and down wandering around. The first thing you know, God fulfills that promise 25 years later, Isaac. And then it says that we are going to go into a land that God promised to our father, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to give them a good land. Yeah, going to get this land. When you think about the trek, all of that Isaac uncovering wells, Jacob and his foxy little tricks, Esau and his bitterness against his brother, and then you get on down, they go down into Egypt, and they're down there, what, 230, 40 years, down in Egypt. A slave people, a ghetto people. And then finally God speaks to Moses and says, Okay, it's time for this people to get up and get out of here. Take your staff, Moses, and get this people, and let's go. And they get out by the sea. These are slave people. They don't have much education. They're grumblers. They haven't scientifically thought this out. They're not great prayer warriors. These people have been busy making clay bricks and building pyramids for the pharaohs. They're not really very celestial-minded. They get out there and look around and say, You brought us out here to let us die, didn't you? And then they start in with this murmuring. they got the Red Sea in front of them, the chariots of Pharaoh behind them, and there doesn't seem to be any way. Moses stretches his rod out over that sea, and the waters roll back one way and the other. What a great deliverance. I'm sure they must have said, this is it. This is the greatest deliverance we've ever seen. Praise God. Isn't this wonderful? Whew. Look, they're across on dry land. Is anybody still in here with me? Across on dry land, we're on the other side. This is the last trial we'll ever get through. And somebody knows somebody else and said, I'm thirsty. Are you thirsty? Yeah, I haven't had a drink of water in a day and a half. I'm a little kid, Daddy, I want a drink of water. The baby's crying. No milk for the bottle. What in the world are we going to do? Hey, we don't have a, hey, the cows are dying. They didn't have water. They're out here in the wilderness. No place to go. No water. The children are without water. The cattle are without water. They're dying. It's one thing after another. Isn't that right? I mean, they don't any more than get past the water, and somebody says, I'm hungry. So God said, that's all right. I'll give you something to eat. And they woke up the next morning. There was snow all over the ground. Well, it wasn't really snow. They said, what is it? That's why it's called manna. What is it? And that's what we say when God provides for us. What is this? Said, I'm going to take care of you. What, what, what is this? And then they eat it and they want quail. They get quail till it runs out their nose, the Bible says. They ate it till it ran out their nose. I mean, you know, this is a mess. Any way you look at it, it's not a pretty picture. And all this is going on and going on. They finally get out here to Sinai and somebody says, this is it. Finally, we've heard the word of the Lord. Moses comes down with the word of God and when he gets down, they're dancing around a golden calf. I mean, if you think these people don't have a problem and you don't think there's something going on in the wilderness and they go to Kadesh Barnea to go across, they're going to finally get into this. All this is being done to get them to this land that was promised to them. What I'm trying to tell you, you say, well, what are you giving us all this for? What I'm trying to tell you is that sometimes we grow weary in the interim because God says we're going to see harvest. We're going to see great revival. Everything is going to be marvelous. And we say, okay, do it now. That was my last message to this church. How many of you stomped your foot with me? I'm still stomping mine. I still believe it. I just think there's another little piece of the puzzle we need to slide in beside now. Because somebody's saying, well, if it's now, how come I'm going through what I'm going through? I thought if it's now, I'm through with all this going through things. I'm through through and. Right? I mean, if it's now, then why, when I put my foot down, did I jar my hip out of place? 
And why is my back stoved up? And why are my bills not paid? And why can't I get this taken care of? And why haven't I heard from my son? And what else is going on? I can't understand. I thought, we, you know, it's another one of those flowery sermons. God's going to send us a revival. It's going to be a great harvest. We have glory. It's going to happen now. Whippy. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. Go to church one more time. Woo. You know, say it again. Yee. You know, it'll happen someday. If God gets ready, well, so what? No, wait a minute. Stop. There's one thing you didn't understand. All the way up to the very door of this great promise of harvest and revival. Or we might say our spiritual promised land. There is one thing after another. But when you finally get there, Joshua finally got there, lines the people up. You know, it took them 40 years in the wilderness. That's right. 1948, remember that's the year that Israel got their homeland back? How many of you remember? Do you know that's also the year that the great latter rain revival fell in America? You don't know about that? The original Pentecostals came in with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but no understanding of the evident operation of the fruit and gifts of the Spirit. In 1948, there came a great revival of prophecy, as you're used to and accustomed to. A great revival of the word of wisdom and word of knowledge. And then people abused it and didn't understand it. And because of that, they went back and lapsed back into a Pentecostalism that left the church lagging and lingering for years. And then 20 years later, in 1968... The great charismatic renewal began in the basement of the Catholic Church where they used to play bingo. People are talking in tongues. In the back of the little Baptist church in the annex, people are receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And a few weeks ago, they said it was of the devil. And now all over the country, denominational churches have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Some folks were satisfied at Sinai when they got the word of prophecy to throw up their hand and say, this is it, praise God. I choose not to do that. I think we've got a little while to go until we get that 40 years done, I don't think it all happened back there. I think it's happening all right here. This is the 40th year. 1988 is 40 years from 1948. This is also the birthday and the year of Jubilee for Israel. It's her 40th birthday. This last month, this month as a matter of fact, is the new year of the year of Jubilee. Did any of you hear about the book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Going to Come in 1988? Did you read some of that? Yeah. Well, he already missed it because he was supposed to come the 11th, 12th, or 13th of this past month. Either he missed it or we missed it. I don't know where he is. I'd like to talk to him today. I may have to. I don't know. You know. He missed one small thing. He had it right. All the signs line up. All the times line up. All the trumpets line up. He's right. He's a brilliant man. When he wrote that, I read that, I thought, I haven't seen this much brilliance in numerical scriptural uh, understanding in years. When I read through all of that, I thought, he's right. Man, wow, 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 wow. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. And then it dawned on me. But what that heralded was the year of Jubilee. But do you know what the last sound was? It was the sound of the trumpet. The sound of the trumpet or the feast of trumpets was also called one other feast. And that was the feast of harvest. He missed one small thing. It wasn't the trumpet to bring the coming of the Lord. It was the trumpet to herald the beginning of the greatest harvest the church has ever known. I really believe that. I believe we're living in the month and the year of the beginning of the greatest harvest the church will ever know. I'm spitting all over this month. I'm getting hoarse. They woke up in the morning. They've been 40 years. It's time to go across. And Joshua stomped his foot and said, Now we're going across. Not later, but now. Somebody say now. now. And he walked out and he looked. And lo and behold, that simple little silver thread of a Jordan River that when I was in it, I baptized people and you had to look around for a hole. It's only about this deep. Anybody could have gone marching across there. No, 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 not this time. We've got a different situation. I'm going to read it to you. Joshua chapter 3. 
This is different. Verse 14. It came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people. And as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water. Look at this next line. For Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest. You never get the harvest without a flood. It doesn't overflow a few banks. It overflows all its banks all the time of harvest. There's not just a little harvest here and a little harvest there. Any harvest you ever get is going to be through flood and through fire. We must not forget that while we put our foot down and say now, that does not deliver us totally from the responsibility of energizing the spiritual forces with our prayer, our intercession. It was so complicated in Joshua's mind. He doesn't even remember 40 years in the wilderness. Forget the snakes and the water. I can't believe I got right to the door revival and the things at flood stage. That's what stuck in his mind. He didn't say, remember what happened on the other side of the snakes. He didn't say, remember what happened on the other side of manna. No, he didn't say, hey, just remember what happened. Yay, yay, back on the other side of the Red Sea. No, 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 it's what happened on the other side of the flood. Why? Because my expectation was so high. My spirit was so ready. I was so anxious. I knew it was God so much. And when I got right to it, it seemed like everything in the world turned upside down. All hell is unleashed against me. Nothing's going right. It won't happen. Wrong. It will happen. It'll be that thing you'll mark all time by someday. You're going to look back and say, hey, it was a flood then, but it's only the name of the miracle that came as a result of the crisis now. As a matter of fact, you always name all your miracles by their crises. Yeah. That's back when the Lord delivered me from cancer. Oh, that happened you know oh yeah that was just after the lord touched our little boy when he was hit by a car that's just after god saved us you know we'd gone through a terrible situation in our business and a bankruptcy and all of a sudden the blessing of god flowed in on us come on somebody say amen i just touched somebody right there you say, what are you trying to say? I'm telling you that on one side of the flood, it looks impossible. But one of these days, you're going to look back and say, that's what I marked all of the blessing and power of God by. That thing became my marker. Hallelujah. Woo, somebody shout. Go ahead and worship the Lord a little while. You know, in the, in the words of Martin Luther, we need to learn something as a church. It's easy for us to get caught up in revival and say, it's happening, it's happening, hallelujah. And say, go ahead, Jesus, do your work. That's just wonderful and fine. But I've got news for you. All harvest happens in crises. The greatest revival the church has ever known has been when she was in greatest persecution. When she was hiding in catacombs, her parishioners came to Christ by the thousands. When they were eaten by lions and torn to pieces in the Colosseums, you couldn't put the church down. The church grew. The Word of God grew enormously during those years of persecution. Let the church slide into a lethargy. Let her get into some kind of an average little slide. And what happens? Everybody goes along in a mediocrity and everything seems fine. Don't worry about anything. I don't think so. Martin Luther said, must I be carried home to heaven on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? No, I must fight if I will win. Increase my courage, Lord. You've given up. You've given up on Holy Ghost revival. Oh, not the church. A few of us. Somebody says, I thought it was going to happen, but I've faced the greatest impasse of my life. Don't 
say it anymore. Just remember, it's the flood stage that brings you into promise. It's the crisis you're going to name your miracle by. If you could understand that everything you face now, write it down, is simply going to be the name of the great miracle God is going to give you. And you're going to remember this happening by. Hallelujah. When I survey the Word of God, I get so excited. When I read David, he says things like this. Given to the Lord, O ye mighty, given to the Lord glory and strength. Given to the Lord glory, do His name, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And then he stops and says, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. Don't look for God in a pleasant place. The voice of the Lord is going to, you're going to hear him. You're going to know where you are when you're willing to wade out into the water. Hey, they weren't by themselves. It wasn't the calamity they couldn't face. Do you know what they simply did? Joshua just turned around to the priest and he said, you take the ark of God. And you get out in front of this people, 2,000 cubits. Why so far? Because there are 3 million of us back here. Get out far enough ahead of us so that everybody can see you. Because we have not passed this way before. I mean, we've never been in a harvest like we're about to be in. We've never seen a river. Get, get those care groups, that networking, stronger than ever. Get those groups be in your group stronger than ever, praying in the Holy Ghost more than ever. Why? Because we haven't been this way before. We're about to see a harvest. Why should God drop? Why should God drop miracles through us if he knows that in our networking there are holes and that the harvest would be lost? We've only inoculated people against ultimate truth if we take them in long enough to frustrate them and then let them go. No, no. I'm going to give you another spiritual principle. Why do we go through all of this background and background, message after message, preaching after preaching? Why do we hear one thing after another and all of this added to each other? Seems like a huge catalog of truth that we can hardly consume in our minds. The reason why is that God has a certain order that he intends to bring to his church. And if we don't come into that order, he's not going to pour out the great miracle and sign and wonder continuously. The Bible said he hath set in the church first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. And then did you scholars, you remember what it says? After that, miracles. Did you ever really stop and think about that? Well, what does it say? Why the, the apostle first? He builds foundation and gives government. Why the prophet next? Because he speaks the word of the Lord concerning the superstructure and the volume of the vision. Why the teacher next? Because he grounds and puts into the minds of all of the people the truth that must be there to hold the harvest. And if you get that networking in a proper order, then God gives you a miracle. A notable miracle that can turn your whole county around. That can turn your whole city around. But we want God to do all of these things without the effort and without the pain of the flood. It's not going to be a simple thing. We're going to have this revival, but we're going to face what seems to be an interminable impossibility. And when we face it and say, it's only the thing I call my miracle by, I'm ready to go. Then the priest of the Lord, he said, look, get out. And the Bible said when they came to the brim of the water, they weren't in the river yet. The thing was over the banks. It was at flood stage. It's all out over the banks. When their feet touched the water, the soles of their feet... And that's what happens. The ministry is out front, often attacked first. Sometimes we don't realize what, why we should pray for strength and for leadership. And the Bible teaches us that we should pray for governors and for those that are in authority. Why? They're on point. They're out front. You've got to be careful. We've got to make sure they hold the glory of God. Because when those men of God stepped into that, woo, into that water, the Bible says that the waters parted and the lower water went down and the other water just stacked up in a heap up high. And they stood in the midst of Jordan while all the people went across on dry ground. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. 
God sits on the flood. The Lord sitteth them on the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. The Lord will give strength unto his people. When I read on over, I acknowledge my sin unto thee. Mine iniquity is not hid. I said I'll confess my transgression to the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. I mean, I'm going to cry to God when I'm in the middle of a flood, and God's going to sustain me and keep me. I can't let any circumstance stop me now from believing the great truth of harvest. God's got to have, you see, what is this all about? God's got to have a church somewhere that breathes harvest, 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 revival, harvest, power. Not just enthusiasm for our enjoyment. Harvest, souls, harvest, harvest for this city, for the nation. Somebody's got to breathe it. Somebody's got to believe it. Thou art my hiding place. Thou hast preserved me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say unto God, how terrible are thy works. Through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee, shall, shall sing unto thy name. Come and see the works of God. Where am I going to see them? He is terrible in his doings toward the children of men. He turned the sea into dry land. And they went through the flood on foot. Let's all say the flood. I'm telling you that the flood should not stop the church. When you put down your foot for revival, the flood, whatever it is in your life, whatever it is in your home, whatever it is in your family, must not stop the church. We should not face it as the ultimate crisis. We only look back at it and mark time by it and say, there's where God brought us the greatest victory of all. Right there. Amen. You remember the glorious scripture in Isaiah? When he talks about The Redeemer shall come to Zion. Let's all say harvest. harvest. No, let's all say harvest. harvest. The Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgressions in Jacob, saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. And then he goes on, he says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. We say, that's it. That's the prophecy of Isaiah concerning all the nations and the heathen and the Gentiles and the harvest and the great revival. Do you know what that's prefaced by? Do you know what the verse right in front of that says? So they that fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun, when the enemy shall come in like a flood. Let's all say it together. Flood. When the enemy comes in like a flood, then the Spirit of the Lord raises up a standard against him. That's what brings the heathen. The harvest is always in a time of flood. Always. Jordan overflows all her banks at all the time of harvest. Does that make any sense to you? You don't seem as excited as I am. Praise God. Praise God. How many of you in here have been facing things this week that you didn't think you could get through? Come on, be honest, old people. See, that's what I'm talking about. And isn't it funny how that seems? It's hard to pray, isn't it, sometimes? You say, everybody say, just trust in the Lord. It's going to be all right. Yeah, that's easy to say when you're standing on the other side of the flood. How many of you have been facing financial crisis this week? You just didn't know what to do. Yeah. Go ahead. Be honest. Yeah. And you put your foot down and said, God, now. You turned around and all you did was just slosh and the water just came up all over you. You're standing right in the middle of a big flood. How many of you know what I'm talking about? 
Yeah. And you said, well, that all sounds good. All that preaching, all that carrying on sounds good. But I am in a flood. What is a flood? It's out of control. What's a flood? It's got a big force. What is a flood? Something I can't handle. Something I can't control. What am I going to do? We just need to get the glory of God out in front of us right now. Come on, you folks that lifted up your hand a moment ago. You said you've gone through some things this week. Hold your hand up high. Right now. Stand to your feet right now. Stand to your feet. We're just going to get this taken care of right now. And some of you have said in your heart, it may sound good for other people, but they're not going through what I'm going through. If you've said this in the last 10 days, I want you to wave your hand at me. Nobody knows what I'm going through. See? <laughs> you too, huh? Nobody knows what I'm going through. Did you say, I don't know what I'm going to do? That's all right. You don't have to know what you're going to do. You just need to know what God's going to do. You need something really bad to name your miracle after. What are you going to call this miracle? Whatever your crisis is, that's when God saved my father. What is that? That's back before dad got saved. Or that's just after mom found God. What is that? That was the flood. That was the thing you thought could never get through. The thing you thought you could never plow around. I'm telling you, we're going to face those things at time of harvest. Don't just expect it back in the wilderness. Don't think it just happened way back there in Egypt. It happens right up to the edge, right to the very edge, right to the very edge of the fulfillment of the greatest promise God ever gave to Abraham. It's the last thing you wade through before you walk up on a dry ground. Abraham! Hey! Man, if you could wake him up, let's all stand up a minute. Everybody on your feet if you can. If he could reach over and nudge Isaac with his little old skeleton elbow. And Isaac could reach over and punch Jacob. They brought his bones back. He said, hey, don't leave my bones in Egypt. I want to be up there with mom and pop and the kids. I want to be at Machpelah when it comes resurrection morning. And if old Abe could reach back and rattle his bones, Sarah, they just made it almost 500 years from the promise. And they just stepped up on dry ground. Can you imagine Joshua's feeling after everything that had transpired? He stands with only one small obstacle. That's where we are now. This is the thing you've got to go through. This is the thing God intends to mark your miracle by. Don't look down and say, I can't make it. Look up and say, this is it. I'm wading through Jordan for the last time. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, wave your hand to the Lord, would you? Where, where is that family? Where's that little boy with a blood disease? Where's that little boy that bring him here? Bring come up here. Right now. Kita Randele Boshunda. That's right. A little boy with an incurable blood disease. This is just the flood, dear. Halama. This is what you're gonna name your miracle by. When our little boy had an incurable blood disease that the doctor said could never be helped. Somebody say yes, Lord. Oh yes. Yes, Lord. Look at this. Kidarama. Well, the doctors say this little guy has to have. Hi, Bub. Hi, Justin. The doctors say he has to have blood transfusions once a month for the rest of his life to stay alive. But see, we're going to come back and mark a miracle by this. We're going to mark a miracle by this. Hallelujah. How many of you believe God right now?
Who else in here has a blood condition in your body? You have a blood condition in your body. Come and stand on one side or the other here just quickly. Have to be real quickly. Stand right here, dear. Stand right along here. Right here. Right here. It's all right, Justin. Thank you, Lord. Stand right here. That's... In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, not in our strength or in our power, but in the name of the Lord and in the power of his might, I now speak the word of deliverance and healing into the body of this little boy. I speak that this body will be healed, that this blood condition will become normal. In Jesus' name, I rebuke all the powers of darkness. I now speak that this is a miracle, that the work is done in the name of Jesus Christ. Everyone who believes the word of the Lord, shout yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Dr. Jesus knows what to do. <laughs> he does. Dr. Jesus knows what to do. God bless you, Justin. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Reach over and take someone by the hand right here. In Jesus' name. Yeah, reach over take somebody by the hand. In the name of Jesus. Take somebody by the hand right here. I curse disease of the blood. I curse conditions in your body now that keep you and your life systems from being normal. I now speak by the power of Jesus Christ that you are going to be well. Hallelujah. Do you believe now? Now, in the name of Jesus. Be healed now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Be healed now in Jesus' name. Praise God. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. You've suffered long enough. You've suffered long enough in Jesus' name. Be healed. Be delivered now. I curse you disease in Jesus' name. I command you, body, to be normal now in Jesus' name. You've suffered a long time. Yes. Mm -hmm. This has been the flood in your life. You said you'd never get through it. But you are just about to step up into promised land today. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Be delivered now. Be set free. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Come on. Lord, I believe. Sundalamo Shadremo Sundrea Baba. Oh, Laman Andrema Yandoro Dondrema. You've prayed all week long, you, that God would do a special thing. You've suffered all you can suffer, and you've said so. Am I right? Is this the word of the Lord? And right now, God says for me to tell you that it's over. You are delivered. It's over. Be set free now in the name of Jesus. Your flood is over. Well, come on now. Put your hands together for Jesus. Hallelujah. Woo. My, 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 my. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! Yeah! 